I was online recently. I, I have a uh, Google News is tuned to psychedelic as a word. And so I read interesting things on shroomery and blue light and nexus. Uh, and there was a wonderful comment. Uh, the question was, do psychedelics turn your brain to mush? And there was a fairly active debate. <laughs> but down in the comments was this. The info I've had seems to show the drugs alone aren't all that's at work in the sort of mind-expanding and creative experience people have. That's why when outsiders try other cultures' drugs without the rituals and cultural context, they often fail to achieve the same sort of insight. In some lab experiments, they've found directing people back toward the specific task or problem really can help. So like most things, it's a tool that has to be properly used to be effective. I'd say that's probably the best summary of what I'm going to talk about I've ever read. And particularly, I love that understanding of set and setting in a, in a somewhat different way of talking about cultural set and setting. And as you all know, the cultural set and setting for creativity is that uh, it's wildly successful for artistic creativity, whatever that means. But from the research side, it's very hard to get anyone to agree that the paintings you did afterwards were so much better than the paintings you did before, let alone having art critics agree on anything else. But if you think about it, it's maybe not an accident or a coincidence that the rise of the personal computer, which gave rise to the creation of Silicon Valley, out of which emerged Burning Man, was concurrent with psychedelic use and research. Um, I remember a, a, a relative of mine working for a small company during the um, we'll hire anybody to do anything uh, kind of boom, you know, that, that bubble of, of companies. And he approached his boss and said, I'd like this particular bunch of days off. And his boss looked at him and said, see on the playa. <laughs> But what we do know, that using these materials for enhanced problem solving is not well understood and a very under-researched area. But there are established methods using psychedelics that open minds to useful solutions to real and solidly scientific problems. And I was part of a group that established the basic guidelines of set and setting, substance, dosage, as well as whatever was necessary really to dissolve the barriers to problem solution. That looks like what was the fundamental issue, is what's in the way, what's between you and a solution when you are a serious scientist in the particular area of interest. So again, it's not take psychedelics and you can understand quantum mechanics. But if you understand quantum mechanics and you take a psychedelics, you may really understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> So I'm going to just go through it and describe some of the, um, some of the ways in which we worked and, this, and then give you, hopefully, uh, some cases, some remarks by individual participants, which is really where the action is. So since I, uh, if I had a uh, PowerPoint here, it would say, how can psychedelics be used to facilitate problem solving? And if you look at the creativity research, there's lots of creativity research. And there's lots of theories. And there's lots of methods, many of which are actually good. And what's fascinating is their useful, good methods are remarkably underused. Things we know work for almost every form of creative problem solving that can make groups work better and so forth. They're unbelievably underutilized in education, industry, government, medical world, and even in the military. See, the military is, is a kind of place where a lot of research can go on because nobody can stop them. <laughs> so they're the above ground version of what a lot of you are doing. And I got interested with some other people in problem solving, which is really narrowing the scope. A problem is something, in this case, that can be measured, proved, built, patented, manufactured, so we're talking way into the material world, 
We are definitely not talking about answering the problem of why does God exist and, you know, those things which you worry about. And so our criteria is, is the problem solved? At the end of the day, is the problem solved or closer to solution? Has an obstacle been overcome? Was the intervention, in this case psychedelic set and setting, the reason for the solution? Because over the years people have said, well, I've looked at your research and how do you know that it was the, you know, it was the intervention that you did that was responsible for creative breakthrough? And my answer is maybe it wasn't, do it some other way. You know, I'm not going to fight you. Um, because there are always the people that say, and you've heard it, well, aren't there natural ways to do this? And I think, what's unnatural about a plant? What's unnatural about something that someone produced in their laboratory? I mean, are there unnatural molecules? You know, anti-atoms? <laughs> Come on. But what, when we were looking at this in the, in the late 60s, no one had tried to use psychedelics for this kind of hard science problem. And, and if you went into the indigenous traditions, there was nothing there really either. Most of the indigenous traditions were using their psychoactive substances for diagnosis and divination, and almost always the major work was done by the shaman, not by the, the, the person coming in with the problem. And what we had going against us was the possibility that this really couldn't work because what we do know, and think of your own experiences, diminished capacity for logical thought processes, is that fair? <laughs> during, during the time of, of, of use, reduced ability to direct concentration, inability to control imagery, anxiety and agitation sometimes, constricted verbal and visual communication abilities, what's happening? <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Tendency to focus on inner events or personal issues. Let's talk about social justice. <laughs> In 100,000 years, is that going to be an important issue? No, okay. <laughs> Lessened ability to describe your experience. Tendency to become absorbed in the visual complexity and visions. And if you say to someone, you know, would you be interested in solving this real world problem, there's a tendency to regard this world tasks as trivial. And therefore, why would you waste good psychedelic substance time on the trivia that dominates the rest of your life? Well, on the other hand, there's increased access to unconscious data. There's more fluent free association. There's increased ability to play spontaneously with hypotheses, paradoxes, transformations, etc. There's a heightened ability, obviously, for visual imagery and fantasy. Heightened relaxation and, and, and openness. That's the opposite of anxiety. Either you're uptight or you're in bliss. That's, a, you know, that's the continuum. Uh, obviously, sensory inputs, way heightened. Heightened empathy with external processes, objects, and people. Um, you know, you, when you fall in love with a rock and you kind of get that it likes you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's heightened awareness of experience. And in the problem solving realm, there's also an enhanced, it turns out, an enhanced sense of brightness the ability to see through false solutions and phony data, as well as lessened inhibitions and reduced tendency to, to censor ideas by premature judgment or negative judgments. And even in the, um, the MDMA world, you know, that's a fundamental relaxation where things can be fully experienced and reviewed and looked at, and in a sense, take that over into the hard science area and you can see where there's the advantage of that kind of lowering of, again, emotional barriers. And there's also heightened motivation promoted by suggestion and right set. And some of you have heard me say one of the reasons that, that my work has all been with synthetics is that synthetics are more easily, um, set and setting can be more important. 
you know, you really can't tell ayahuasca what you want it, want it to do because it says, you know, I'm so much smarter than you. And I've been around so much longer. Um, just throw up and listen. <laughs> But when you're using LSD um, or, or mescaline uh, or psilocybin uh, from the lab, you have some advantages. So that's literally, and so the only variable, hard science here, the only variable we could meddle with was the heightened motivation um, promoting suggestion in the right set. So that's what we did. Now, how did you get into one of our studies? Actually, how could you get into the only study we were able to do? because the government said, well, you're doing interesting work, stop. <laughs> the problem had to matter. Okay, a lot of people have asked me, gee, I have some problems I'd like to solve. And the answer is, how important is it? And you really had to be pretty obsessed to get into our study. And you had to have the necessary technical knowledge for such a problem. And one of our ways of testing that is, are you being paid to solve this kind of problem? And that suggested to us a reasonable level of competence. You've worked several months on the problem and failed. That's, that was one of our really, because when you fail on a problem and, you know, and you're smart and you've spent 10 years in graduate school and blah, 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 that's hard. And you're getting paid for it. Now, you've got extra credit if you're angry at yourself, your company, or the client. Because <laughs> what we were really looking at is people who were who really wanted to solve that problem. That was their issue, okay? It's a little bit like people who go down to Peru and they have a serious disease. Their motivation is really clear. They are not there to have a good time. They are not there to have a pleasant experience. They are there to save their lives. That's the kind of motivation, you know, we weren't quite at that level, but we were pushing. Now, what kind of problems did we did, did basically our scientists come in with? And let me just give you a quick list of a sample. Photoconductivity decay processes. Hold your excitement. <laughs> New design of a vibratory microtome. Space probe experiments to measure solar properties. Improvement, this is the 60s, improvement to magnetic tape recorder. <laughs> a dining room chair design. It turns out in the furniture design world, dining room chairs are the hardest because they are seen from all sides and they have to be incredibly durable. Um, so it turns out that's a good, difficult problem. Mathematical theorems regarding NOR date circuits. Uh, this is something that's used in chip design. A conceptual model of the photon and then we had a couple of wonderful architects design of a commercial building, design of a, prop, of a private home. And again, they had to have been working on it in, these, in, the, in the architecture ones. The client had been refusing things. Uh, the private home, what he said is we'd spent hundreds of hours. Our office was losing money hand over fist with this client. It met our criteria. We had 44 problems attempted and no solution for four of them, okay? Then I wanna read you a little bit from the description of what people were doing. Now, I, these are, basically all this is taken from my book and there's lots more in the book. That's not, well, it is promotional, okay. Um, but what I'm saying is that if you are seriously interested, um, there's a lot more of what I'm talking about. Uh, particularly with these much, much longer descriptions of what people were literally doing uh, as they reported to us later. And this is from one of the architects. My experience during the session was an unbelievable increase in the ability to concentrate and make decisions. It was impossible to procrastinate. Cobwebs, blocks, and, blo and binds disappeared. Anything was possible. But I was working on real and rather tight problems. The designs were freer, but probably more from the standpoint of removing blocks in the consideration of what the client might accept. Three designs were outlined in three hours. All were accepted by the clients. Okay? That little wow is all of you that deal with such things. 
The two houses referred to are now complete and I feel very successful. They're freer than my more usual work, but not untypical. The clients would be horrified if they knew the history of the conceptual design. <laughs> Then, I think right now the clients would say, oh, that's cool. <laughs> Let me join you and let's both go over the design. <laughs> this is definitely an enhancement of the ability to visualize, but my experience was, and this is the name, that, that I became a better Heinrich Bull and was not converted to an, converted to an instant Gaudi. So what he's saying is he really did a better job of being himself. Uh, another piece here. The simplest problem was attacked first. Almost immediately several relationships that had escaped my attention became apparent, apparent and a solution to the spatial relationships followed soon after. I avoided looking at a watch, but I would guess about 20 minutes elapsed. Normally I would stew and fret for weeks before coming to such a solution. Don't misunderstand me. On a simple problem, the period at the end, which is productive, is often quite short but in any case, a matter of hours. And then later on in the afternoon, having made some solutions, he said, at this point I said to myself, would not be fair to Barney not to give his house one more try. That was the bad client. The only scheme which excited him was too much money, but he didn't lose face. This time my approach to the problem was unrelated to all the previous attempts and I looked at the challenging site in a new way. I really believe the solution that resulted in a few minutes is better than those that preceded it. This was a job that had taken several hundred hours. So, good, right? And it commented again, I showed the sketches to the client a few days later, they were approved. Three, year, three weeks later, I prepared working drawings. I put, but I put my sketch pad, he'd made a huge number of sketches during the afternoon, I kept my sketch pad closed on the desk beside me. A few hours later, after the first dimensional sheet was done, I compared it with the original. It was almost exactly the same. I had, without scaling the original sketches, laid out three acres of buildings, parking, outdoor theater, walls, patios, in the exact dimensions, and kept it in my head as clearly as it had been, what happened is he actually saw the whole building completed, so much that he walked around in it. He went out and counted the parking spaces, which were totally correct. He looked at the way the beams had been laid, and what size bolts, it was that level. So what he says is, I'd kept it in my head as clearly as it had been when I walked through it. So he didn't use any of his sketches to do the hard drawings, because he'd been in the building. Um, here's a different one. I decided to drop my old line of thinking and give it a new try. The mystery of the easy dismissal and forgetting did not strike me until later, because I'd many times had managed to work the whole thing into an airtight deadlock that I'd been unable to block. See, this is why we like these people, because there's an emotional component there that's very important. They cared, they'd suffered. I dismissed the original idea entirely and approached it differently. Then things began to happen. All kinds of different possibilities came to mind and I quickly sketched them out. Each new sketch produced other possibilities and new ideas. I began to work quickly, almost feverishly, to keep up with the flow of ideas. Okay? You're getting, I want you to get the, the, the texture of this rather than the content. Uh, this is one from an engineer. Uh, he was f the formation of a visual image corresponding to the heat distribution of an object such as the human body. <laughs> Application for medical diagnosis since disease tends to have a higher temperature than surrounding tissue. Another insight at this point was the most efficient way to do this, and some of you may not follow all this, an expansion of gas that was superior to other, any other operation. I visualized the two thin film layers formed by vacuum evaporation spaced at about the wavelength of yellow light. Many pneumatic cells of this shape um, can be formed this way. If the thermal image is projected on the array, the temperature reacted by each cell wall will determine the pressure of the gas and the consequent elastic deformation of the thin films. Um, 
I want you to get the level of complexity of intellectual, intellectual thought that was going on. And this is the way he thinks. Um, let me skip a little here. So from a lovely man, scrutinize the modus operandi with which I attack the problem. You just got to love people like that. Realize that my mind was looking, working like a computer, and although I could not visualize the local level operation, all known constraints about the problem were simultaneously imposed as I hunted for possible solutions. Um, I think that's pretty good. So that's what we were doing. Um, and there's lots more of that. And what we were demonstrating is that if you're interested as a culture, in doing good work, would you not use things that make it easier to do good work? And quoting uh, Julie Holland, uh, a wonderful phrase that I recommend to all of us, it is unethical not to be doing psychedelic research. It is unethical. And that's where we are. So now you have your kind of elevator sentence <laughs> about all this. And the question is, <clears throat> if we look at what are the great breakthroughs in science that have changed the world, and were any of those related to psychedelics, the answer is yes. So biology, DNA, uh, double helix, uh, Mullis's work on the reproduction of a tiny amount of biological material. And in the science area, what we would call basically the computer revolution. And uh, there's a wonderful book, What the Dormouse Said, which is saying, why did all the computer breakthroughs happen on the West Coast in Northern California <laughs> when all the computer heavies were on the East Coast? And he makes the case that if you take a place called Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park and you take a one mile <laughs> radius, what you find is there was this overlap of psychedelics and scientists. And he makes a very strong case that that was what made the revolution happen. And this is before Steve Jobs you know, told us about himself and so forth. And before all those companies went to Burning Man for a week and hung out with each other. So there's a lot, in a sense, going on in the culture and what I'm doing with this kind of work is bringing back the notion that we can maximize the successful nature of creative problem solving in the hard science areas if we understand really how powerful and effective set and setting is. And I said, remember, we, we could manipulate that. And we had no idea that this would work, OK? We just really. Uh, one of us, which was Willis Harmon, full professor of electrical engineering at Stanford, said he hoped it would work, and he, that's, he was the, the force behind it. And people like me thought, man, everybody's just going to trip. I love it when I'm wrong. And, but we told everybody, the first group, this is going to work. This is fantastic. You're going to have the best time of your life. We did everything we could to push set and setting. And we got them excited, and these are mm, of our 28 people, I think 26, had had no psychedelic experience. Um, well, this was the 60s. You could be a scientist and not have psychedelic experience. <laughs> it's harder, I'll tell you. <laughs> and we, we also administered some psychological creativity tests. Summing up that, everybody did better. Nobody ever cares about the results of any of those. Uh, but, you know, you've got to have a measurement. So we no longer think you have to have a measurement. You just have to have success. And they had some terrific breakthroughs, and we thanked them, and they were taken home by their sitters. And then we all danced around the room, <laughs> saying, it really worked. It's really true. <laughs> Everything we told those guys was exactly spot on. And then the other groups were really easy, particularly because we began to have people calling us and saying, my lab buddy was in your study last week. Um, particularly, this was the group doing the Norgate mathematical stuff, and don't ask me a question in the after what I'm talking about, because I don't know. Um, 
But that group said, he came back so excited and with so many interesting ideas, can I sign up? And I think we actually had a couple more of those guys through. So um, let me hold off here. Uh, we have some time for questions and answers. And um, those of you who are seriously wanting Q&A and are willing to not rush off to find some place affordable outside of the hotel for lunch, um, or welcome to stay a little longer, and we'll do that. So Q&A, please. Uh, let's see what we can do. It's a little hard with the, with the light. OK. Uh, question, and you'll be given a mic. OK. Yes, please. You said that the research that you did was mostly with psilocybin and LSD. Is that right? Uh, we actually were using, the question was, what did we use? We were using LSD and mescaline. Oh, and um, mescaline. Somewhat interchangeably. Um, did you find any either uh, more effective than the other? No, that's why we used them interchangeably. OK. But of course, we believe they were interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Set and setting. <laughs> OK, we used to believe that mescaline was harder to use because people would get stomach upset. And then as our guides got better, that all stopped. Okay. Jim, your, your work has fascinated me for many years. Uh, this is acute effect stimulation of creativity. Right. What about um, subsequent? Okay. This was an acute effect. What about subsequently? And let me just give you doses because I'm talking to you all. Um, we used 100 mics or 200 um, milligrams of mescaline. Uh, what we found from the reports of the scientists is they had a period of from one to eight weeks where they felt they were generally more creative. So that's a partial answer. Uh, the other thing that some of you know I'm working on microdosing, and it looks like that's a, another way in which creativity can be enhanced uh, with less of the set and setting. But the important thing, again, for problem solving, it is actually how much you care not how much you take. So you talked about, uh, you know, you have to already know what's going on. You have no quantum physics in order to do good quantum physics. But uh, have you done any research with uh, trying to learn something, a new subject, while under, uh, like reading a math yeah. textbook have you, or something? The question is, have you tried to learn anything, had any research on learning something with new subjects? Um, well, I have some reports. And the reports are people taking exams. And my favorite report, um, and thank you because you are in the room, uh, <laughs> is about taking an exam. I believe it was in um, developmental anatomy, something like that. And this person was stuck with the after exam. You know, they missed the exam. And their teacher just gave them this incredibly hard exam and looked at this guy and said, well, you know, it's, that's what we do when you miss the exam. And he'd taken his last hit of acid, because he used to take a little acid before every class. <laughs> and after going into deep despair, he closed his eyes. And the first diagram that she'd put on the board, the first slide from the first day, was there. And then he could see all of them. So he just kind of enjoyed himself doing this exam for a couple of hours, blew the teacher's mind entirely. And as he remembers at the end, the, the, the little grasses that he could see out her office were really lovely. <laughs> uh, there's a letter from Jack Kerouac to Tim Leary saying that he took some substance and he suddenly had an understanding, I think it was like of the Tang Dynasty. And he was recommending that this should be a kind of university course of helping people recover information, maybe that they'd had in their heads, and maybe it was from collective unconscious. So the answer is, uh, and if any of you want to send me your stories about learning new information, uh, that would be fine. So that's the best I could do with that. Yes, please. Somebody has the mic. I have and yeah, I heard you. I heard you mention sort of jokingly about the impracticalities of using ayahuasca. Uh, at that time, and I'm wondering, in um, I'm studying uh, shamanism in the um, in the Amazon right now, and I'm wondering, in all seriousness, how you think that? I mean, to me, it seems like it would work pretty well for something like this. But I'm well, the nice think. thing is, is um, 
My book has one serious limitation. It's limited to what I know something about. I've got other books. <laughs> Being an academic, you're usually not limited by that. Um, but I have recently, and just actually yesterday, saw some footage of someone, an art, a, an, a teacher of anatomy in the Amazon who came to ayahuasca to stay for a number of weeks to, as he says, to learn to draw the invisible anatomy, which is the anatomy, you know, that I can't see my, the way this joint really holds together because I've got a shirt and an arm on top of it. But that doesn't mean I can't see it in a, from another place. And what was interesting in that footage, and it's very exciting, is that his capacity to draw clearly the visions he was seeing kept improving, and he indicated that's because he was both in the hands of an expert guide and that ayahuasca basically liked the idea. And he begins to draw more and more cellular and molecular things, and there's some, some just remarkable breakthroughs. But what we were getting is here it was being used with the full acknowledgement of a shaman in a traditional setting, but this young man had arrived from France with this in mind, and it was being used that way. So the answer is, like almost everything else in this conference, give us a little bit of time. Remember, we've had a 40-year lull in the no research area, and I'll give you a better answer in a year or two by quoting somebody else who's been doing it. But that's a good start. So the answer is probably with, again, set, setting, intention. And as you listen to this young man on the, on the video I saw, that's what he wanted to do. He was not there for personal growth. He was not there for, he does mention that he gets reborn and a few other things, but that's, <laughs> he really doesn't, you know, that isn't what he's there for. And it's wonderful to see, because he says, well, here's, here's the diagram of how I, what I looked like when I was a tree. <laughs> and, and, then, and then here is a cell, me mechanism, and then somebody who's a professional in the area says, that's what we would draw for, for our textbook that you have seen just from inside and with no, with no background. So, uh, someone over here. Remember, question is short and has a question mark at the end. Yeah, hey Jim, I have uh, experience with microdosing. Um, what I'd be more interested in is set and setting without a guide. Um, I know you talk about sort of the time frame of letting them sure. have sort of freedom, but then get down to work. Okay, so. the, the, oh, set and setting without a guide. Um, that's kind of like saying, how about AA meetings without meeting, from my point of view? I find, a, I, don't use the word guide because that suggests someone's controlling you. Use the word designated driver, which is someone who's there should you need anything, such as, does anyone remember where the bathroom is? Okay, or is that food or is things like that? So, so I'm... <laughs> You know, do not eat the plate <laughs> or put it on your head, you know. The purpose of a guide is so that you can do more of what you came to do, period. So guide or, you know, people who say, well, I don't want a guide is fine. You know, as you know, you can make love without another person. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> but certain things, other people are helpful. And so I'm kind of a, I love being in this crowd and I'm the right wing fanatic. <laughs> Which is, see in my early research we did a, a kind of review of the first hundred clients and about over, somewhere in the 89, 91 percent said this was the single most important experience of my life. Well I think, if that's going on, is it so bad to have a guide? Right? Now, if you're saying, well, man, I've been dropping at concerts for 20 years and I've never gotten hurt, the answer is, I'm not going to change your life, uh, but I, I don't have much I can tell you because you have more experience than I do. See, one of the things that's nice about my book is there's zero about recreational use, because if I said anything, a number of you would just come up and hit me, because <laughs> I'd get it wrong. So as I say, limiting it to what I know, Yes, of course you can do scientific problem solving without a guide. That's why there are a lot of companies in Silicon Valley that are worth a trillion dollars. Do I know much about how to suggest that? My basic feeling is I know something I think that's more useful and more fundamentally to the point. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with 
with not being guided, except if you get in trouble. And those of you, you know, who had more trips than you would ever admit to your parents, usually have some bad, some very challenging and, and difficult experiences in there. And almost always when someone says, da 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 bad trip, I say, do you know what caused it? And they say, yes. Okay? And what they say is, set setting, I was with people I didn't trust, um, police came. My favorite is everything was going fine until the car burst into flames. <laughs> I have a lovely one, a 16-year-old was driving home somewhere in New Mexico, you know, long distances, and she said, I began to realize that I didn't know what a car was. <laughs> and then I didn't know what a road was. So I pulled over. And I said, did you get home? She said, oh yes, my younger brother, who was also stoned, drove us home. <laughs> so there's, you know, that's a kind of good, safe story, but not one that I suggest, you know, we repeat. You know, it's wonderful to be able to be conservative in this crowd. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, oh, Jim? Hey. Somewhere there, the mic in person. Hi. Yes. Uh, just a question on the guides again. Um, I assume with this scientific problem solving um, situation, you, the guide would be uh, not using any of the substance, but are there other situations where you feel like it's better with the gu when the guide does take some of the substance? No, okay. Should guides take some of the substance? Um, there are two points of view, yes and no. <laughs> That's a nice thing, it's a clean one, you can't say it. And the, uh, the other is, and, and on the yes side, can you take just a little so you track better? And the answer is it depends on how much you are able to track. See, the guide also, in a, a good guiding, you know, when I really have done wonderful guiding, I bring something to read. Because, particularly in the morning, we're using the standard, which is now the kind of standard in all the research I hear, which is lie down, headphones, music, nice room. During that headphones, nice room, you can, you don't, you, guiding has nothing to do with it. A guide is a little bit like on safari. You know, you're on safari and we're taking this 10 mile walk and suddenly the guide said, you see this rhinoceros running towards us? I don't want to just, you know, it's your trip, you paid for it, but personally, I would stand behind a tree. <laughs> so guiding, at best, is minimal. And so the question of should you have a substance with that is really a matter of, of skill level. Um, and in the shamanistic world, sometimes everybody but the shaman takes material, sometimes the shaman takes a little, sometimes the shaman takes a lot, and you all take a little. It really depends on the knowledge and skill and set and setting. Uh, as I say, the work I've done and that I prefer is the guide simply is, is able to be in tune enough, but not likely to drift off into just a lovely little space for a while and miss a cue from one of the participants. Okay? So that's, that's my kind of right-wing response. <laughs> yes, please. I, I walked in a bit okay, late. Okay, wait a moment. Already, Sorry. We may not, have already not touched on this. My life uh, or from this. your experience with, uh, with these substances and the, uh, the creativity and the problem-solving abilities that it gives you, is it only specific to the actual hallucinogenic experience, or does it have lasting effects into the future? Does it make you more creative in general, even when you're not yeah. on hallucinogenics? Was that a question? Yeah, I'm curious to know. Give me it again. Okay, so with the creativity and the problem-solving ability that you're referring to right. from these substances, right. it's enhanced while you're on the trip. And for four to six weeks thereafter. Okay. Thank you. And um, I've talked to some of the people. I'm one, of my, one of the people in the studies, I don't know, 82, and he recalls it vividly. He, return, he, he basically has become a serious artist, which he wasn't, but using the same material skills that he had. Um, and he remembers it vividly, and he never had any interest in taking a psychedelic again. He, because what, and I think Heinrich said it very well, I didn't, I became a better Heinrich Bull. And that you can retain. So. I don't know, two, three hours? What? <laughs> Sure. Okay, five minutes more and then we'll do whatever we do next. Okay. 
do you, do you have a vision of what our society would look like if psychedelics were legal and healthfully or not integrated into society? Question, you know, what's my vision? Under what substance at what dose? <laughs> The answer, the answer is, honestly, I haven't really thought much of it through, because the nice thing is, if you've been, you know, in a sense, uh, again, I'm, the suggestions that are being made is how can we make that, whatever that vision is, sooner? And the answer is to let everyone know that you've attended this conference, that you know. Not, you don't have to say anything about it, just that you attended this conference. Uh, what's nice is when you're, I'm, I'm across the street, so there's strangers in the elevator, and I flash my badge, and almost everybody says something like, that's cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, some years ago, they'd say, what's that? And in the 60s, they'd say, oh, are you one of those bad people? So we're in a cultural, sh the, the vision is already happening. Um, I think we owe an incredible debt, which we will have in the future to them, to the mar medical marijuana and the Students for Sensible Drug Policy, who are indeed getting the camel's nose under the tent. And when the first medical marijuana work was going on, people said, this is simply a device to eventually legalize marijuana. And we all said, no, it's not. <laughs> we just care for sick people. <laughs> but then, as someone pointed out, why is it that I have to have PSTD, dying of cancer, or other, or have cluster headaches in order to have a, a safe and potentially sacred session. And that's why I think Julie's really got it, and your applause I will pass on. Actually, Julie, you're probably here, so I hope you're feeling good about giving us our new slogan. And those of you who happen to be in the business of making creative breakthroughs uh, for a living, do they let you have coffee at work? Right? I mean, if you're at Google, they feed you 24 hours a day. If you're at certain law firms in Palo Alto, they feed you 24 hours a day. They do anything to keep you happy and productive. Uh, this is simply something that is useful. And my vision is that, my vision is there is a possible alternative culture that I would like to live in. I would like to also live in a country where freedom of religion, freedom of science, and freedom of personal exploration is considered a fundamental not something you have to go to the Supreme Court every year for. So that's my vision. And I think we are the, uh, we're the Frodo's carrying our little ring. And yes, the forces of Mordor are everywhere. However, so are we. So the more we get visible, the more we out ourselves, the more we allow our colleagues to accept us and, and find out that half of them will out, uh, the sooner things will be changing. Um, since the government declared LSD illegal, 24 million people have taken LSD in the United States. And for those of you who say, where could he get such a figure? U.S. government. <laughs> and if you think that's the, if you think they got everybody. <laughs> Here's a government form. Please list the illegal activities you've done in the last month. Okay. So the culture is, mo is much closer. It's, it's kind of, this is, the, this is the next round of the 60s, only there's an awful lot of people in power that won't stop us. That's why, that's why MAPS is doing such wonderful work in so many areas, because they simply kind of find who are the people who are grown-ups, probably had psychedelic experience and won't say so, or are simply genuine scientists who say science means you get to investigate the universe. And you guys might be able to help people who can't be helped otherwise. So we're, I think the vision is already well underway. And no, I don't know what happens if, you know, my third grader is given, you know, little ayahuasca like kids in South America, you know, the, the dime you get. I don't know, but uh, I think it's probably going to be better than the way we're doing it. Shall we agree? <laughs> okay.
Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.